All right, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. My name is Izzy, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm joining you from the land of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation here in Western Australia. Um, I am of Asian descent. I have uh, black hair that's out, tan skin, and I'm wearing an orange shirt today. I'm proud to be your guide uh, for this webinar, and I'll be helping facilitate this important discussion on inclusion in early childhood. So just before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that even though we're all meeting virtually, um, I'm meeting on the lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we work, live and play. We pay deep respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We also want to acknowledge that there is no justice without First Nations justice. I'd like to encourage everyone watching to pop in the chat what lands they're joining from. So, so in today's webinar, we'll be um, having a recap of what we mean by inclusion and the need to balance building your um, mind set and skill set. Then we'll be talking through tips on information, supports and funding. After this, we'll have a five minute break and then we'll come back together and talk about some other things to consider and have some final reflections. So CYBER's approach, we believe that hearing directly from young people with disabilities about their experiences helps families, caregivers um, and communities to have high expectations and aspirations for all their children. We ask today that we are all respectful of one another and are inclusive. Sometimes in talking about our experiences, we might get a question or cover a topic that is sensitive or includes tough things to talk about or to hear. So during this and other webinars, um, we use content notes. So we'll warn you um, that what we're about to talk about um, is, for example, um, ableism or discrimination. Um, and then people can choose whether or not they want to hear that information. So you can just um, mute the conversation until um, that discussion is ended. Um, and later on, we might, when we have a Q&A, we might not want to answer a particular question posed and the CIDA team might step in. Um, this isn't cancelling the question or shutting down the conversation. We just want to make sure that everyone's needs are met, both yours and ours. So just a reminder um, that if you feel this webinar brought up some difficult or uncomfortable feelings for you, please do reach out for help. Um, you can access help by heading to our website, so www.cida.org.au, um, and we'll put the names of supports in the chat and you can also have a look um, on the screen. You might wanna take a photo of this um, before we proceed. And thank you to those who put their um, land in the chat. We've got people from all over Australia, which is really exciting. All right, so um, each panelist will introduce themselves, but today we have with us um, the young people, Izzy, myself, we have Georgia and Emily, and then from the CIDA team, we have Sue, Daniel and Ewan. Please check that your screen name is correct and add your pronouns such as she, her, they, them, he, him. Um, that will help us use the correct pronouns when we're addressing you. Um, and we'll now ask each panelist to introduce themselves and also, also share with you um, the headline of their favorite childhood memory. So I believe Georgia is first. What? Hello. <laughs> Coming at you, say hello. Say hi. <gasps> say hi to everybody and what's your name? Hi, my name. George. Yes, that's Georgia and she's 16. <clears throat> so has a little bit of attitude when she wants to. Georgia, what's your favorite childhood memory? What's no. your favorite thing when you were little? No. Okay. We don't have a favorite memory from when she was little, <laughs> but it probably would have had to do with the wiggles. So I think Emily will introduce herself next. Hi, I'm Emily. I have a white complexion with brown hair and I'm wearing a black with white spotted jumper today and I'm also wearing red framed glasses. My favourite childhood memory is of going to uh, the beach near the shack that I spent growing up most summers and playing with my siblings at the beach. 
So my name is Izzy, my pronouns are she, they. Um, and my favourite memories, I've got quite a few, but they would all have to do with spending time with my family and my siblings and the various uh, mischievous things we would get up to. <laughs> Thanks, Izzy. Sounds like a, um, a topic for further inquiry later. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Sue Tape. I work for CIDA, so Children and Young People with Disability Australia. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm joining you today from the lands of the Yugara and the Turrbal people up here in Brisbane. Um, my role at CIDA is around uh, inclusive education um, and a visual description of me, I'm a middle-aged white woman with uh, dark brown, short curly hair, and I am wearing black glasses and you might catch sight of Lego in my background every now and again, due to the two children <laughs> that live in this house as well. Um, my favourite childhood memory would be anything to do with the beach and water. And I'll pass over to Liz, who is joining us um, from Cider as well. Hello everyone. Yes, I'm I'm Liz, and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm calling from uh, Wurundjeri land, um, people of the Kulin Nation, and uh, I uh, have um, grey blonde hair. Can I say blonde? Not quite grey hair, maybe. Uh, so definitely not a young person. Um, and I wish I was. Um, I loved being young. <laughs> I'm enjoying my maturity as well, but. I, I have, um, uh, so grey hair, uh, I'm wearing a black top, I've got a blurred background with a red painting in the background. And my favourite memory is uh, enjoying eating watermelon with my brother at kindergarten. And Ewan will pass to you, please. Okay, um, I'm Ewan, I also work for CIDA, my pronouns are he, him. I have brown hair, uh, brown glasses, a red brown beard and a black shirt. Um, and one of my favorite memories from childhood is getting to ride in the Batmobile at Movie World, which is pretty cool. Thank you so much. Everyone. Pass back to Izzy. Oh, cheers. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, the webinar will have Auslan interpreting, which you should be able to see on the screen along with the speaker. Um, if you can't, we will maybe try and pin um, the Auslan interpreters. Um, this session will also have live captions and they'll be visible at the bottom of your screen. Have we got those up? Awesome, I just can't see it, my bad. <laughs> um, if for some reason you can't see it, click on the CC button, there you go, I should have clicked on that. Um, and that will be at the bottom of your screens and that will be able to access captions. If you do have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Um, the session is also being recorded uh, so we can share it with other people. It will be on our YouTube uh, channel, I believe, yep. And if you are having any technical issues, please private message our webinar support person, so either Liz or Ewan, um, in the chat. Awesome. So um, the first three webinars in our series of six uh, topics inc uh, included inclusion, identity, language, and where to start with inclusion in early childhood. We also looked at the role of early intervention in early childhood and tips on where to start. In the later webinars, we're building on these ideas and with young people like us as your guides, we will look at what, um, what does all of this have to do with school. So we'll move into part one and start with an overview of information, supports and fundings, and then uh, recap what we mean by inclusion and building your mindset and skill set. So in this webinar, we're going to explore three main topics. So information, supports and funding. Along with insights from our experience in childhood, we'll explore what topics of information might be useful. Um, we will share trusted sources and how to effectively use that information. When we move on to talking about supports, we're gonna cover how knowing uh, what the purpose of these supports is critical. And we're also gonna talk about the people that can be important in supporting your child and family. We'll also cover what adjustments might be most helpful, um, how being included with adjustments are critical parts of childhood and how those arrangements can be made. 
Finally, when we talk about funding, we're going to be talking about how families might go about identifying what funding might be useful for them, um, where that could come from, what paperwork might be necessary, and who can assist with this process. Even as a young child in play-based settings, there are components to inclusion that are crucial to participating and learning. So physical inclusion, um, that's present and fully participating in the same learning environments that is accessible to all children for the same amount of time. So in one of our earlier um, webinars, we talked about that fine line between early intervention and inclusion and making sure that even though we are going through all those early intervention programs, that we are still allowing our children to be children. Um, so the topic of social inclusion is socially all children are welcome, supported to belong and not separated from their peers on the basis of disability or difference. So we know there's a history of segregation um, with uh, the disabled community, um, but really trying to make sure that all spaces are accessible for all. And then we talk about curriculum inclusion. So that means that the curriculum is delivered accessibly so that all children are included in the same learning material with appropriate support and adjustments. So next we wanted to return to the idea of finding balance in your role. So for families, that balance is between mindset and skill set for inclusion. So I'll pass over to Sue. Thanks, Izzy. So speaking. So um, the slide that you can see here that's it's quite busy, but I wanted to get you to focus, if that's all right, on the orange arrow, what, what we're pointing to. So in webinar three, we talked, as Izzy said, we talked about balancing, building your mindset and your skill set for inclusion. So this webinar today really focuses on access to and use of technology for gathering, filtering and digesting information. So what does that mean? <laughs> what we mean is the, there's so much information out there. Um, and we want to talk about sources, reliability, how do you use that information, um, and really draw on the experience of the three young people um, and their family member that are joining us today to get a greater understanding of, of how you can sort of swim through carefully all that information, because it's such an important part of um, advocating for a young child um, and building your skill set as you move that child towards um, the education system. So that's why we would like to talk about this earlier than possibly many families do. Um, acknowledging also um, some of the things on the left-hand side around mindset, where often um, you know, the search for a diagnosis or the search for support um, can draw us away from some of um, those skills that we need to build. Um, so yes, so we're gonna move on, please. Um, and talk about challenges, Izzy. I'll hand back to you. Izzy speaking. So there's a lot of challenges to consider when navigating information, organising supports and funding. I know it can be really overwhelming. Um, some of these that we'll cover when we share our stories and insights, um, but we wanted to first look at sort of challenges overall. So one of the challenges is that there is a lot of information and influences out there. So it can be really easy to be overwhelmed and at the same time have a vast array of inputs to help navigate the early years. Um, but accessing information in 2022 means children and family need access to reliable and affordable technology. Sifting and sorting and working out what to do um, with that information can take a long time and for families um, number one on the wish list is targeted information for their child and their individual family's needs. Um, searching for an answer to diagnosis and defining disability tends to drive conversations and choices, not necessarily the natural rhythms and activities of childhood. And you've probably experienced that, again, talking about that balance between having a childhood, but also trying to make sure that your child is re receiving the help that they need and the support they need. So another one of the challenges um, when it comes to supports is naturally if someone um, offers to help or direct families, um, uh, the families of young children, they'll look for trusted sources, welcoming places and reliable people who help them achieve the outcomes of their goals. Families will look for people to help guide them and provide supports that help them. Families uh, may find that they're offered special programs or services, um, and this might mean that they miss out on typical um, or have less time for typical childhood experiences. 
And so families, we acknowledge that, you know, you'll have to make decisions every day about juggling priorities and family needs and circumstances. Um, this warm welcome feeling that they need um, to take up the special options does impact what a parent's natural authority or approach to making decisions can be. So another challenge, the final sort of challenges are with funding. So we wanna encourage families to look for supports and fundings that are aligned with their vision for their child and their family. And again, um, please avoid the risk of focusing only on your child's diagnosis, um, which does mean that things can be really hard work and it can be hard work emotionally, physically and socially, but it is really worth um, you know, tending to your child's needs and making sure that they get to have that childhood that they deserve. So passing over to Sue. Thanks, Izzy. Um, so we're going to spend a fair bit of time now working through those three topics. So information, supports and funding and really drawing on the experience of Izzy, Georgia and Emily. Um, Recognising that Pat has um, pulled together some great points from Georgia's experience and we'll be sharing those with you. Um, and one of the things that we... Um, have asked young people to do is that where an image can really um, speak to experience um, in this area. And so I'll get you, Liz, to go down to the next um, slide. Um, and this is where with Georgia and, and Pat's permission, obviously, we've got some delightful um, pics of early childhood for Georgia. Um, and a lot of these will um, be quite apparent as Pat shares George's story. Um, so we're going to first turn to, um, so we'll come back to the delightful Georgia, <laughs> if we can go down to the next slide. Um, so we're going to first look at information. So there are um, obviously, there, you know, we've talked about there's lots of information. Um, we're really reflecting um, on how a lot of that is digitally available. So we're talking about online sources, et cetera. Um, but we also wanna dip into with um, Izzy and Emily and Georgia sharing their experiences about um, using that information effectively. I just wanted to go to the next slide briefly before we hear, hear from um, the young people. Um, and uh, you and shared in the chat earlier the, the link to the slides, just to show you um, the volume of different sources of information that may be available um, and how at times it may feel like it's uh, a bombardment over people um, and just, I suppose, helping families and young people with disability to navigate these spaces for effective information. So on the slide, I've got sources of information. There are three columns. You've got digital, people, and places. So taking into account that information can come from all those sorts of things, news, social media, um, blogs and influences, advertisements, etc. cetera. Um, and a lot of it's subliminal. <laughs> so happening with that information coming to you without actually you requesting it. Um, but the other part of this is also the sources of information. So the people around you, whether they be family, friends, um, people in similar situations, your employer, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is recognising that in those early stages of childhood, um, there are different places that you might get information from. So it might be an early childhood setting, an education setting, health and other parts of the government or policies and programs you're interacting with, or just in your local community as well. So I just wanted to recognise that there is a lot going on there and it might be a useful way to have a look at how you access that information, um, where you put your trust and reliance, and I suppose how you filter that stuff as well. Um, so we might stop sharing the slides just for a moment because it would be great to see everybody's faces as we talk about stories. Thank you, Liz. Um, so we're starting with information and I have asked um, Emily, Izzy and Georgia and Pat to think about those questions. So what information do you wish 
that you had access to in that early childhood stage? What types of information would have been useful? Um, and what things do you wish you knew about? Now, um, it will become apparent as we work through these stories that we have three very different um, people joining us today with three very different experiences. And that is um, part by design, but part by delight. So um, really excited to hear from you. So um, Emily, I'm going to throw you into the, <laughs> into the mix first and really keen to hear from you, please, about on the area of information, um, what things would you like to bring to people's attention? So the main thing I wish, I guess, my family would have information on, because um, I was diagnosed at five years of age, so just starting school, and that's when obviously you would start joining things like sports or um, joeys, which is the youngest version of scouts um, or guides and things like that. And the wish what my parents had was information on how to support the people around me. So if it was volunteers, if it was sports coaches, those people who aren't necessarily paid to receive that kind of training, because they're often thrown into the deep end. And also making sure that they have the information and the avenue to be able to advocate and say, this person is not the right person for my child you know, and ensuring that, um, you know, the burden is just not on my parents to, because obviously I was a very privileged person to have family members who did have that knowledge and have that experience, but they actually had to went out and sort it and, you know, provide that support to other people. And that's just another thing that they had to go and do. So being able to have that as part of the whole package, I guess, and you get given when you find out, you know, diagnosis and all those information would, be, would have been very beneficial. Thanks, Emily. Um, Pat, can I get you to reflect on um, your experience with Georgia as she was growing up around sources of information, please? Yeah, for sure. So for us, um, it was a little bit different because Georgia was diagnosed at birth with a genetic condition. So... For us, information was hard to come by because her condition is so rare, um, but also just knowing how to navigate the special needs world and what services she needed. Um, <clears throat> I remember our paediatrician said to us, oh, well, you just go to the community health centre and get physio and OT. I'm just like, what's, what, what? <laughs> like, how do I do that? And he just assumed that I would know how to do that. Um, and when she was about 14 months old, <clears throat> we needed to get a CPAP machine. And there was lots of people that said to us, you can apply for this funding. It's called this and this, but we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to get it, but you can apply for it. I'm like, that's great. But I don't know. It, whenever I spoke to people, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know where we could get it. Um, so we were lucky. We could hire a machine for a little while, but then we got our play group fundraised for us so we could buy a machine. Um, but yeah, I just think that, I mean, this is almost 17 years ago. So things were a lot different to what it is now. Information is a lot easier to get these days. Um, but even just having a central place where you could find out financial support or um, how to go about finding therapists and things like that, or just having a group of parents in a similar situation. So we didn't know about the special needs play groups until she was a, a bit older. So just those sorts of things really come in handy when you're little um, to be able to get the best supports for her. So, yeah. Thank you. And Izzy, I'll throw over to you. So the space of information, how do you reflect on, on information in your life? So I guess um, I like to be honest about my experiences and I have an acquired disability that I got diagnosed with later in life. Um, but I guess the main sources of information for me now, I'm trying to navigate being um, diagnosed and being disabled, it has been social media. Um, 
I really do find that with the disabled community, social media has been such an eye-opening experience where people can show up authentically um, and access spaces that they otherwise can't access. Um, and, you know, I, I do a lot of advocacy work with other young people with disabilities and all of us have sort of mentioned how connecting or following disabled influencers has really helped our journey. Um, you know, there's things like people who might have physical disabilities who have never met other people with those same physical disabilities, but now that they're online, they're being able to see how other people with those disabilities can do certain movements at the gym or what accommodations that they might have. So those are really, um, I do encourage a lot of people to go out and find those uh, social media influencers. But another thing is, you know, just finding access to free services is so difficult and it's so difficult to understand if you're eligible or not. Um, and in WA specifically, we have a number of um, advocacy organisations which are free for people with disabilities, um, regardless of if you have NDIS or not. Um, so you can call, so in WA, we have people with disabilities WA, so you can call them and they always have um, an advocate on the phone line um, and you can also apply for advocacy help so um, you know that can be with NDIS support or you know with any workplace issues or um, schooling and education issues but they are a really good place to go to find out what services there are out there and you know what you can actually access. Um, yeah, I guess that sort of information would have been really helpful for my family uh, to know what services were out there. Um, as I mentioned a little bit um, earlier before we started the session, um, my family grew up quite poor. We relied on um, Centrelink. And, you know, as a result of that, when financial concerns are always at the forefront, um, it's really hard to then go out and find all these other supports. And it is really expensive finding adequate supports. So for my family, I wish that we had known, yeah, that there were services out there that could direct us in the right way. Thanks, Izzy. Um, so we might move to talking about supports. Um, so I've asked um, the, our three speakers today to think about the types of places or, or activities um, where they might need supports or adjustments and just how that happened and how, how that place can be enjoyed, who helped out, um, you know, what was the experience. So when we're thinking about supports, we're um, talking about, well, what's the purpose of the support? What will it help um, drive as far as day-to-day -day, um, activities, the basics of life, um, which, you know, no one would call the basics of life special needs. They are just the basics, getting up in the morning, et cetera. Um, and also um, some of those things to sort of access the activities that you enjoy. So, um, you know, going beyond food, housing and um, education, but, you know, getting out in the community and being part of that community. So that's why I've asked people to reflect on. So, Emily, I'm going to throw to you again. Um, and uh, if you could share with, us, share with us your thoughts around supports, please. So when I reflect on my childhood experiences around support, a lot of things that came to me was through more involuntary supports. So things like community leaders, things like volunteers, people who weren't paid to be a part of my life incidentally, like teachers and all those people. One of the main places I went to, especially early one, was Joey's. And my, as my older brother was a Joey, I kind of tagged along too. And I think what the kind of support I received in that situation where the people who were the Joey leaders, well, my father was one of them, but it's besides the point, uh, were two wonderful leaders who ran a very tight ship and it was a very structured environment. And I think that was a very important support for me to have there. And to also to be able to engage in activities in a way it was 
the inclusive things like for example I remember an activity where we had to make little aliens and we were given recycled items that was donated in from families and things and that's something I could do I could able to make my own little alien and you know I might have needed help by like cutting and things and that's where um, the adults stepped in but mostly I was able to participate alongside the other kids and having fun making these aliens at Joey's. So yeah, that's kind of how supports worked in my life. Emily, I was just going to ask you a question if that's all right. Um, Izzy was taking us through a recap before where we talked about those different components of inclusion. So physical, social and emotional and um, curriculum. Would you, um, so if you look back on your Joey's experience, um, where do you think those supports were, or what area do you think of inclusion those supports were most important for? Was it your physical or your social yep. or emotional? I think the supports kind of fell into both of those categories. Obviously, as my main disability that impacts me day to day is my deafness. So having the structure where, you know, we set up an environment that allowed me to be able to hear the other children and being able to talk on a time and having that strict structure, but also ensuring that I was able to go to environments and just be a child and be able to create friends and meet another little girl that was named Emily and also having induction, just like all the other children and just having those same experiences. And I think lastly, what was most important by the support um what it was it was a visual thing like the other kids saw that the support that I was getting and it was a thing that it became normal that it was accepted and okay that I received help and a, and a thing that it wasn't shamed um that I needed that support thank you I think that's that's really important points is about normalizing that some people will need different types of support to participate in the same activity or enjoy the same things so that's great um Georgia and Pat can I throw to you next so we're talking about supports and and what you've found useful during Georgia's childhood please yep um so in her early childhood we didn't really do a lot of we didn't do group sports or anything like that um as I said earlier we did go to a play group and it was a normal play group so it was just all average kids I joined it because my sister was going there with her daughter, her son, um, and everyone was great there. There was nobody um, questioning or passing judgment or anything like that. So it was good that we could just go and be ourselves there. We didn't have to worry about anything like that. Um, and everybody that was there that was was supportive. Um, <clears throat> we didn't sort of have any. We haven't really had formal supports besides obviously teachers and things like that, until we've had NDIS and they're still paid supports, but um, family and friends have been the biggest supporters for us. Um, I suppose in some ways the biggest issues for Georgia was mobility and communication um, because she didn't walk until she was three and didn't talk till she was, I think maybe five or six, give or take. Um, so she would always need either me or dad to be with her to be able to communicate what her needs were um, or be able to physically move her to places. So if we were going somewhere and we couldn't take a pram, then that would be an issue. Um, but most of the time we would do things with friends and family and they would be aware of that and they would be, you know, um, making those plans and decisions based on that. So um, I mentioned earlier about how she used to love going shopping when she was little and it was great until she got too big to fit into into the top of the trolley and they were kind of like stuck as to what we could do but now they've got things like the caroline carts i don't know what woolies and stuff call them but it's essentially the same thing where someone with a disability can sit into it and you can go shopping so you know those things are great compared to 14 years ago when she was little and that sort of thing so um but yeah our main supports have always just been family and friends really we haven't sort of had, and obviously the school and, and therapists and things like that. But um, yeah, that's been most Thank of you. it. Yeah. I suppose um, the advantage of social media these days too is that people yeah. can find out about things like those shopping trolleys that, um, you know, you can use for people who might need um, to have a seat or, um, I don't know, 
Um, I've always found it difficult to juggle um, my daughter in a wheelchair and a shopping um, trolley yeah. at the same time. So, you know, being able to share that information now um, using social media and, and, you know, raising expectations, I suppose, yeah. is the other thing of, of where yeah. people um, could expect or, or would like those things as and well. And I think that's the, the greatest thing. Like, <laughs> So many people said over the years, social media is rubbish, blah, blah, blah. I said, but it's the best thing ever because... You meet other families, you can connect and you find out information from other people across the world. So like I said before, Georgia doesn't have, fit into a group. She doesn't fit into a, a little niche of diagnosis. So we are always looking in multiple places to try and find information. And that's social media has been the best thing for that. So thank you. Yeah, in that regard, that support's been amazing. Fantastic. So Izzy, um, support. Um, reflecting on obviously a different experience but what have you found useful in that space please? Um, so I guess I sort of agree with everything that Emily, Pat and Georgia have also said. Um, just touching on the social media aspect you know as soon as I was diagnosed I sort of um, joined all these online forums and groups like that and you know there's a lot of information that goes through there but as well there's a lot of helpful information because you know if I couldn't afford some sort of treatment or my family couldn't afford certain things um, you know there's alternative uh, treatment ideas that are sort of posted there people who have gone to doctors and been able like specialists and been able to say hey like this is what they've suggested for me and then I don't have to go and find a specialist which often there aren't specialists available in my area so that can be one really good place um I also found similar um, to the others as well is that often my supports are volunteers or our family and friends and I just wanted to acknowledge that you know when it when you're carers or your support people are your friends and family you can feel like you're a burden to them um, and that can be very difficult to navigate but at the same time you know if people are offering you support um, just make sure that that you show how appreciative you are but they are offering they want to be able to help so you know sometimes we need those supports from other people and it's okay to ask for help um, and also touching on sort of those different areas that you can have supports in, so curriculum, physical, social, emotional. Um, I had a really difficult time with school, um, particularly high school, um, where I wasn't finding the supports I needed for my disability. Um, and it wasn't until I sat down with particularly empathetic teachers who actually um, went and talked to all the other teachers that I had who really listened to my needs and advocated for me. I think that, you know, when you're a young person, it can be really hard to find the language to advocate for yourself, especially when you're going through it and you haven't actually got that insight to what is happening. Um, so yeah, hold on to those key players in those different areas in, in you know, your sports, your schools, because, Looking back, you know, I, I was, I played in a lot of different sports and after um, acquiring my disability, I had to quit all of them because there weren't the supports necessary um, to continue with those activities. And I wish there was. Um, I think Emily sort of said that a lot of those volunteer people or those people in those sporting environments or joeys um, often don't have disability awareness training and so you know they might be trying the best that they know but you know their best intentions can also be infantilizing and can be um, you know just a neg negative or trivial trivial experience of what disability actually looks like and means so you know if you if you are going to a a sporting group or something that doesn't have that adequate training you know maybe connecting with those advocacy groups or um you know referring them on to places like CIDA who might have um free or to pay for training so that they can adequately support your child Thanks, Izzy. I think um, something that you said then's triggered a question, if that's all right. Um, so infantilizing, it might be worth just um, 
explaining what that mis- means and what that means at, uh, for a person with disability. Um, and I suppose fitting into that, having high expectations, if you wanted to talk about that for a little bit, that'd be great. Absolutely. So infantilizing is this idea where, you know, people with disabilities, um, you might talk like sort of like baby voice, for example, you know when you talk to children um, you use that different tone and you know a lot of people use a similar tone with people with disabilities or assume incapability um, so you know that that can look like a whole different range of things from talking differently to um, helping without asking or you know people who are wheelchair users you know people might move them out of the way and it's it's disrespecting their dignity and their rights to exist as a person and as a person who is valid in their experience um and then the second part of your question was was about high high expectations yes Yeah, there's a really great TED talk actually by Stella Young called The Soft Bigotry of Low Expectations. Um, And it sort of goes on this idea that um, people who are disabled, either you speak to them um, in that infantilizing way. So you treat them um, as you treat us as if we don't have anything worth to say or we're children. Um, Or there's the converse, the other side of that, where you treat Um, people with disabilities as as if they're inspiring for just doing daily things you know Um, that idea that oh it's so great that you can work or that you can go to school and you're disabled as well it's so great that people um, you know are there to support you know it comes from that like charity model of disability where it's like you know we need to go that's a very historic model but basically it's like you know we need to help people with disabilities because they live such an awful life um, and we, we've very much moved away from that model to more of a human rights model, which understands that, you know, our bodies may be disabled, but a lot of the time it's society and the barriers um, within society and perceptions that harm people with disabilities. So, you know, it, it's either having very low expectations um, and then having high expectations of others. You know, if a person with disability can do this, then so can an able-bodied person. Um, yeah did that sort of answer a bit of that absolutely thank you i'm going to throw another curly one at emily if that's all right so taking into account your professional experience um i'm interested in if you could reflect on those high expectations but supports and adjustments for people in for young people sorry young children in in learning environments and how um how your work and and your experience as a person with disability yourself Um, helps you to look at um, making sure that children are learning on the same basis and that they're having you know with supports with scaffolding I was wondering if you could talk about that and your your views on that absolutely so funnily enough as work I work in education so I'm kind of in that safe zone where I kind of have to get the supports that I need because the, the whole point of education is being able to provide sorts for children. So they have to kind of support adults as well. Uh, and I think in terms of my experience, just stepping a little aside a little bit and talk to my personal experience. And I think the most important thing is to kind of show the supports that I'm receiving to the children and them seeing that. For example, you know, I've asked the teachers to repeat things or I've asked... Um, for help for all sorts of things and then the children seeing that and going oh you know it's okay for me to go and ask for help as well it's okay for um the students who have disabilities in the classroom to go oh I'm really struggling with this it's okay to have accommodations the other thing we do um which is a starting to be a bit of a common thing I guess is a thing called UDL, which is Universal Designs for Learning. And it takes learning and it looks, trying and spreads to every corner. So for example, you might have a lesson on maths and you might include a visual aspect. You might include a doing aspect. You might include a, a session where you're talking for those audio learners and really take, taking up and doing the learning in all sorts of different ways, but also, combining that with differentiation and being able to 
specifically target students that need support and make sure they get what they get from all ends, both from the disabled to all the way to the extended, and to ensure every student gets what they need. And I think really, again, showing that and really saying, okay, you know, you need some help with math. So you've got math with me on, say, a Tuesday morning, and that's okay because they are getting what they need and we are all learning and we are all different people and we all have different needs and that's okay. Fantastic, thank you, Emily. Um, we're gonna, before we take a break, we're just gonna briefly talk about funding. And when I say briefly, um, only because funding is a, and I'm using my hands here, significantly big topic. <laughs> and we're gonna drill it down. Um, so this is definitely not, um, how to on NDIS, but I thought it was really important for us to reflect on things like, um, you know, your experience, the process, how you use it effectively, you know, recognising that all three of you are coming from, from very different experiences. Um, so um, because I know what Emily's going to talk about, we might go to Pat and Georgia first, and it kind of builds. You'll see there's a bit of sequencing that goes on. So, um, Pat, I'll throw over to you if that's all right. Yeah, no worries. So, um, as I've mentioned before, Georgia didn't have funding from a young age. Um, because her condition is genetic, she does have an intellectual disability. She was in a special needs school Um the services we got when she was younger for physio and OT was through the community centre. Um, and then we had fun, uh, we had packages through ADIC or DADIC, whatever it was called at different times. Um, so, but there was no particular funding for her, like the NDIS model. I know there was better start funding, but we didn't qualify for that because her hearing and sight issues were diagnosed when she was seven. So that was the cutoff. Because of her developmental delay, she didn't, express autistic traits until she was a lot older so again we missed that cut off um so anything there was no funding until she was 11 um when it was i think it was 2016 i worked out earlier and that first time we got ndis funding we barely used it because i had no idea what to do with it um there was no real instruction or explanation on how to get services or what to do with the services Again, we were only really using speech. Who we're, we're lucky we've had the same speech therapist since she was two, um, on and off between going through community services and, and then private. Um, <clears throat> so when we first got the NDIS funding, I didn't really know what to do with it. Didn't know where to get ex um, information about it. And it was still fairly new too, I think in 2011. Um, so there wasn't a lot of information on what to do. Slowly, it's got we've gotten better at using it, as well as they've got better at explaining it, how to use it um, over the time. Um, still, it's um, not perfect, obviously, and it's not the best for everybody. And things like at the moment, we're waiting to get a wheelchair because Georgia's got increased mobility issues. Um, she's had a foot surgery a couple of years ago, and then she broke her ankle last year, and now she's got foot issues again. So she's not we don't want her walking a lot because basically she's just going to do more damage and she's in, she's got a very high pain threshold, which a lot of people with disabilities have. Um, so quite often we don't know that she's in pain until she starts behaving like a very, very cranky person. Um, but anyway, so waiting for things like getting a wheelchair or getting equipment can be quite frustrating with NDIS because it takes so long and you've got to prove you know, with every inch of your life, why you need it and, and all that sort of stuff, which is frustrating because my son doesn't need a wheelchair, so I don't, wouldn't apply for one. If she didn't need it, we wouldn't apply for it, um, which I think is, is the hard part with NDIS is because it's meant to be individualised, yet it's still, you know, we still need to fit into a box. We still need to fit into that criteria, which doesn't exist for her, especially because of all her different issues. Um so yes, it's wonderful. We've got NDIS funding, and I wouldn't, I couldn't be happier. You know, she has her therapies. She needs more funding, but you know, and yes, it's hard to get things, but it's a million times better than having nothing and picking which therapy we can have each month because, you know, I couldn't work because of all her needs. So, you know, it's it's a big difference compared to early on, and it's a lot easier. 
I think it's a lot easier to get the funding these days than what it was. Um, if you've got your certain diagnosis, it's it's easy. You fill out the form, you send it off. You know, there's no, it's a big form and it's a pain in the butt to do. But in relation to previously, it is a lot better than what it has been. So, um, yeah. And I think, I think that's an important reflection, um, which is why sometimes I suppose families that are new, um, you know, have, have just had a child or, or newly discovered diagnosis to recognise some of the, the challenges that have come before and, and some of these systems have been pulled apart and put yeah. back together. But, yeah, definitely. So, Emily, I'm going to throw to you now. Thank you, Pat and Georgia. Um, can I get you to reflect on your experience, please? Absolutely. In terms of education, I was what's called the piggyback chart. And so we'll put the definition I created into the chat. So basically what piggybacking means is that I was placed in a classroom where there was another child. Um, in this case, it was a child who was a wheelchair user in the same class. So I also received, wheelchair, received TA time with a teacher aide, but I didn't have my own funding all the way through until basically university. I did receive a little bit of support in college, but that was through the teachers annoying the Catholic, the college board, ensuring that I got the accommodations that I need. So what I think in terms of um, those kind of fundings is that you re they really had to be creative in how I got funding or it was even off their own back. Like for example, during a lunch time, I think it's like on a Thursday or something, a uh, teacher aide would stay back during her lunch time and help me my nine times table. And when I got to remembering my nine times table and completed that test, I was given a little gift and that was just off her own back. And I'm really thankful for that. Now as an adult, even though I've got the NDIS, the NDIS doesn't cover all the supports that I need in the areas of my life. Um, for example, I play football um in a mainstream club and it has been ridiculously hard because I know I've been placing myself into a div one which is the highest div in in my region but the co the coaches as brilliant as they are and, the, and that they've got a team that they can kind of pull for support they haven't had they don't have any training they don't got basically flying you know by the pants and hoping that they're doing the right thing and it's also uh, it was really hard to start off with because you I didn't have that support, but also to the fact that because it was that high expectations and, you know, basically playing with girls who are AFW ready, it's a complete spectrum of skill. So um, in realising, you know, oh, I don't have the supports I need, should I go back? And probably what didn't help was the support of the girls didn't really appear. I guess, to begin with, and, you know, it was really a big switch and a big push to have that support in there and to kind of teach the girls how to surprise support, the supports that I need. However, the result, though, of just having that perseverance and working as a team, we've been able to have me play on the field for a game, which has been an amazing experience for me, the highlight of me kicking out a retired AFLW player out of the full forward position um so yeah so that's something that I hope the future looks into and looking at how not necessarily the person with the disability gets support but those around them fantastic thank you Emily and finally Izzy I'll, I'll throw to you if that's all right for you to reflect on your experience yeah so um I have not been able to access any funding um unfortunately and I, I did just want to acknowledge that you know a, applying for NDIS is its whole own complicated mess um, and I just wanted to reassure you that if you are not back you don't get the funding that you need it doesn't make you any less valid in your disability um, unfortunately NDIS doesn't cover a whole host of disabilities um, and it also doesn't acknowledge the intersectionalities that people with disabilities will experience or can experience. Um, you know, for example, if, if I were to get NDIS funding and I'm sort of in, in the process of trying, but I, I have very little hope because I know that it's not my disability is not covered. 
Um, but even if I were to get funding for my disability, I wouldn't then also necessarily get funding for my mental health, which was also a big section of like my life and what I have to experience. Um, and sort of just touching again on that, it, I just, um, NDIS and all, all, a lot of different funding options offer, often work from a deficit model. So you sort of have to prove how unwell you are, which can be really difficult when, you know, if you've got a dynamic disability and, and at certain times you're well and other times you're not. Um, and that can really take away from the autonomy and sort of independence that individuals have. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge that and acknowledge that some of the terminology around NDIS and around supports can be unhelpful. So, you know, for example, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of euphemisms for disability, um, sort of like twice exceptional, um, like, again, this is a really common one. It's used in schools, like special needs. Um, the idea that, you know, our needs are extra or special when, when in fact, you know, the need for care is part of the human condition and we all have needs, whether we're disabled or not. Um, so, yeah, going on my little rant about, about deficit models. But, yeah, I guess, um, like I said before, a lot of the support that I've gotten has been off, off the backs of others. Um, and them caring and going above and beyond their roles. Um, so yeah, I'm hopeful for the future and for NDIS, um, but yeah, you are still valid if you don't have NDIS. <laughs> I think that's a really important reflection. Thank you, Izzy, and thank you all. We're gonna take a, um, sorry, Pat, did you wanna go? You've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Izzy, that's very well, um, explained um, oh. when I when I was saying before that yeah NDIS can be easy um, I think in regards in compared to what we had to deal with previously it is still a horrendous anything that the government gives you to fill out is I think we when we originally applied for the carers allowance when Georgia was a baby we were declined I'm like how much more disabled do you want her to be like this is a genetic thing it's not changing she's not going to grow out of it and then we also had to reapply every 12 months or whatever it was. We had to reprove that she was still disabled. You know, so there are some parts of it which are just infuriatingly painful. And yeah, if they turn around and say no, you're just like, what more do you want? Would you like my blood type? You know, like they want to know everything. And yeah, it's it can be hard. And if you don't have somebody that can support you with that, I think is really difficult. Um well, I think the advocacy groups are so important now because they give people a better voice. Because if you word things a certain way, you get better access. If you word it a different way, it's a straight out no. So, and which is so hard when you've got intricate or multifaceted disabilities. It's not just an intellectual, it's not just autism, it's not just CP. There's so many different variations. And so I, I agree with you, it can be so hard and disheartening when it's not it's not an easy straightforward thing but the government still wants it to be easy and straightforward they still want us to fit into those particular boxes they've got they've designated um so yeah it can get very hard in that regard very time consuming yes so i'm going to get us to pause <laughs> Um, because when we come back, we're going to talk about the role of advocacy um, and also developing self-advocacy skills for young children and, and how we can build on that. Um, so we're going to take a five minute break. So um, based on New South Wales, uh, Victoria and Queensland time, it's 5 p.m. So just a five minute break, we'll be back at 5.05. .05. So take the opportunity to turn off your camera and um, go on silent and we'll be back shortly. question answer time. Oops. <laughs> so just before we move on to a Q&A, we want to mention advocacy and the three different types of advocacy that are worth thinking about during a, a child's early life. So as the Raising Children website um, says, advocacy is speaking up for another person's rights, needs and interests. Being an advocate involves understanding the issue, thinking about the children's needs and presenting solutions. You can help children learn to advocate for themselves by building their confidence and giving them practice. 
So self-advocacy is when you support your child to find their own voice, uh, you look for opportunities to practice. And that might mean thinking about the time and place and the supports needed. And often what's really helpful in self-advocacy is teaching your child the language um, that can be understood by others about what they're going through and why they need the supports. So this is distinct from families advocates for the child. So this is where um, children are front and centre um, and you'll need to prepare and practice your message and your approach. So it will always serve you well to be clear and patient. Um, finally, there might be times where um, you might need a professional advocate. So this should always support or work on behalf of your child and your family. Um, and the primary focus should be to help speak out and defend your child's rights and interests. Um, so the CIDR website or Ask Izzy is um, how you might locate an advocate in your area. And Ask Izzy is a website, it's not me. <laughs> um, the other thing that I quickly wanted to mention is sometimes, uh, you know, in early childhood and you might be in a therapist office or you know in some receiving some sort of treatment um, it's really important to include your child in the conversations about what child, uh, what treatments they are consenting to so you know using language that children understand um, and really asking people like the, the child if that's something they want to participate in um, I have a colleague who is deaf and um, at a young age was forced to wear hearing aids and didn't want to. They actually would have much preferred um, to speak Auslan and be a part of the deaf community, um, but they were told that they had to have um, hearing aids. So, you know, that's just one example where we really need to center the child as the expert of their own disability. So um, now we'd like to take some questions. So if you use your Q&A function um, to raise your questions, um, Liz can help direct yeah, questions to us. I was going to uh, throw a curly one first. <laughs> um, so we've talked about um, infantilizing and high expectations and um, helping to sort of also build the self-advocacy questions as a child. Um, what things, um, I suppose, and I'll, I'll throw this open, um, what sort of things do you suggest to families of young children to sort of kickstart that? Where, you know, thinking about that before school age, what do you imagine would be a great way to sort of kickstart that um, idea of being their own advocate and um, finding a way to talk about what they want or what helps them to be successful. Anyone want to jump in first? I can. Thanks, Emily. Um, so as a child, I basically, I started the same sentence if I met anyone new. I basically said, hi, I'm Emily and I'm hearing impaired. Obviously, I would change that now to deaf as I identify as a deaf person rather as a hearing impaired person for personal reasons. But that opened the conversation up pretty quickly to go, oh, I have different needs. I'm a different person and need different things. And also, to, when I was growing up and I had needs, I was the squeaky, probably a thing that I learned from my parents is I was the squeaky wheel. If I was really struggling, I'd be like, I need help. And all those kind of things. And I think it was also really important is how that was received. Um, I remember a time, yes, it's a little bit later on, but when I was in high school, I worked really, really hard on my debate speech and the computer didn't work and it didn't touch my speech and I was forced to rewrite it on the day. And I was really upset and I was really panicking. And obviously because of my deafness, I actually have to speak out loud and practice it over and over and over so I can get my speech right. And I was really upset and I was really stressed, but funnily enough, that same night was the parent-teacher night. And I advocated, said to my parents, I'm really stressed because I have to re-all do all this again, even though I've already spent three days on it already. Um, their parents talked to my English teacher, who was also the debate teacher. And the, when the debate teacher found out, she went off on the team and was like, how dare you make her redo it when I've seen the draft? that she has done and has already done the work. Why did you force her to redo it when you know 
she has to spend the next three days practicing her speech when you guys don't have to do that. So it was really important to see that, I guess, that need and that advocacy taken on board and taken seriously. And I think that's something that the child needs to see, especially from an early age, that when the issues um, having problems, that they are taken seriously. Um, Pat or Izzy, did you have any reflections on um, building people's, uh, building young children's voice before we move on? Because I know Liz has got a question for everyone. Izzy, you wanted to go? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess from my experience, um, I work in self-advocacy at the moment, teaching young people how to self-advocate. And, you know, um, some of the age groups are a little bit older. Um, but I guess it really comes down to initially being able to understand how you're feeling and communicate those feelings. So some um, tools that are commonly used are a feelings wheel or an emotions wheel. Um, but there's some expansions on that where it's not just the emotions it's also you know what that looks like um, on the outer sort of circle so um, and then there's there's some really great resources just at Kmart um, on like emotions cards and it's like this is what sad looks like this is what happy looks like and giving that language so that people can or children can advocate and say you know I am feeling this way and then that opens up the conversation for someone to be like okay, why are you feeling this way? Um, and another thing to um, recognize alongside the emotions wheel is um, some people with autism have what's called alexithymia, which means that they don't really connect or understand emotions. It's hard for them to process and understand how they're feeling. So in those cases, there's these things called heat maps. And what was done was there was research done to show where different emotions are felt in the body. So basically they're little heat maps of individuals and it's saying, you know, when I'm angry, I feel anger here. Or when I'm, ang uh, or when I'm sad, it feels like this all in my body. So that's another way that um, you can use, you know, different tools to help explain your language. That's really helpful. Thank you, Izzy. Um, I might do that for myself. <laughs> um, Pat, did you have anything you wanted to add here? Or um, I think for in, in regards to Georgia, it's very hard to get her to self-advocate because she doesn't really understand the whole process. Um, I think with having an intellectual disability as well as everything else, um, She's got expressive and receptive language disorder, so she doesn't have the same skills. Um, in saying that, though, if she's at school and there's kids that are annoying her, she's very good to be able to scream at them, go away or move or whatever. So in that way, she's she's good. She can stand up for herself. But I think in a more direct way, I don't think she'd be able to. So um, we work on the zones of regulation and things like that with school and get her to understand emotions and how she's feeling, but a lot of it she just doesn't understand. So, which I'm sure is probably the same for a lot of kids at different ages and, you know, it'll probably come when she gets older, but yeah, it's good to know that there's lots of ways that we can teach her to, to learn how to advocate and learn how to understand herself, so. Thanks, Pat. And Izzy, you were gonna say something? Sorry, you're still on silent, Izzy. Every time. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say that firstly, I've popped the heat maps in the chat. Um, I also wanted to give a quick shout out. So if you're in WA, um, the Youth Disability Advocacy Network is running a free self-advocacy course. It's five weeks for young people with disabilities. So um, that includes an online program and a podcast that runs alongside that. Um, and lastly you know often when we talk about self-advocacy or advocating we want to offer solutions and I wanted to say you can be really creative with what those solutions look like you know sometimes that can be using your lived experience but obviously when we're talking about children who might not have that insight or that language um, you can have little cards um, I've seen around being like this is what I have find out more here or, or just like teaching your children you know if you want to find out more about this Google it, you know, like just using the language to um, allow people to not 
put the burden on your child or on you to always explain everything about the disability and encourage other people to look into it. Thank you, Izzy. Um, one of the things I've found, um, I suppose it might be worth reflecting on just, just now quickly, um, with my child, um, a lot of her communication um, is around her self-advocacy is in her non-verbals. So what she does with her body, how she um, manipulates my body as well. So one of the clear um, messages that I will get often if I have overstayed my welcome in the classroom at drop-off time, um, a very loving two hands placed on two cheeks, two bottom cheeks, and I am gently directed towards the door. Um, and it doesn't happen every day. It's only when I overstay my welcome. And one of the things that I've learned um, based on listening to adults with disability who use alternative communication is to recognise that as communication and also to role model it to um, other people in the classroom, whether it be her peers or also um, you know, other staff in the room to say, you are telling me with your body that it is time for me to go. Okay, love you. Goodbye. <laughs> so um, I, I think that's there's such a range of um, communication um, approaches um, to self advocacy, and um, you know it's tapping into those and finding ways to express that. Um, so yes, <laughs> there's a there's a range of um, uh, nonverbals that we could we could go into, but they are particular to you know the person that I love and um you know it is always different and I suppose it's finding it recognizing it and um rewarding it and celebrating it as well so um now Liz had a question for us in the chat she was very interested to know um whether any of the panelists wanted to share an example of when they've used um a professional advocate and how was it for you so has anyone had that experience? Pat, yep, I'll throw to you oh, first. Hi. Yep, so um, as I mentioned with Georgia's NDIS, we haven't quite got enough funding for the things that she needs, which is mainly the behavioural therapy. Um, and so this year we um, spoke to uh, an advocate oh. to try and find ways oh. to be able to improve her application to hopefully try and get, you know, plan reviews and things like that done. Um, so it was good. It was hard to find an advocate in New South Wales um, in the Western region. So it was a bit difficult. Um, but, yeah, I think it's definitely worthwhile for, for people to put those um, questions out there because other people know so much more. Um, like I said before, it depend, everything can depend on the way you word something. Um, you can word things a certain way and it means something different or it gives you a different response. So, um it was definitely worthwhile and we they were very helpful. Um, so yeah, so it was good. Thank you. Sorry, I lost my mouse then. Um, Izzy or Emily, did you have you had experience with a professional advocate, whether it be in uh, I suppose disability funding or or in other spaces, maybe um, in the health space at all? Uh Yes, in a lot of different areas, but um, for me, I suppose when I was trying to access the NDIS um, the first time and the manager of hearing Australia at the time was like, this is unacceptable and sent me off to an advocate and I found it quite scary because I wasn't told what their role is, are they going to be nice people? All this kind of stuff turned out they actually are from the disability world, one of them being a wheelchair user and another having a child with a disability. So it wasn't um, that confronting. However, they really need to tell people and to teach people what the role of the professional advocacy is and what is their expectation and how they're supposed to treat you because sometimes they don't treat you with respect. I've known of people who had advocates that weren't that great. Luckily, I haven't that experience myself, but I have heard of those experiences. So when I spoke to my advocate that I had, we talked a lot about, you know, what kind of reports I needed and all of those things. Fortunately, I failed a second time uh, after all the supports and things like that, but they were really good in um, 
kind of understanding my views and thoughts of things, even though my parents had a complete different perspective from me at the time. And it was also really good that they were able to help me kind of get the courage to advocate myself and as adult and actually support me to step away from using my parents. And that is a really big step, I think. And that's something I think that's what I think parents kind of what need to realise is that at one point you do actually need to step away, sorry. Um, especially for those who do have that power and that can do that because it's not a skill that's necessarily taught in schools and things like that. It's something that we kind of fall into. Um, so, yeah, just making sure that we know our rights and things as well is really important. Um, I didn't know most of the rights until I did a equivalent of a master's level study so that's a bit appalling even though I did know most of it but there was a lot of new stuff I wish that I knew of and there were important things in terms of advocacy, advocacy especially um, things around dignity of risk and trying to convince people yes the risk like for example playing football yes the risk is, is ridiculously high for example I was in my first practice match I got injured I was the only one that did uh, because I didn't have the skills and things how to manage the tackling situation um and you know but at the same time when I wanted to play in a real game I had to like try to explain that yes there's other things going on besides this but like this is my choice to play football I understand the risks and yes I am placed at a much higher risk to play football but I still have that right to play football um but yeah, it makes things very, very messy, I guess. So that's just another thing we need to think about as well. I suppose if we take the dignity of risk idea, so the opportunity to have a go, to potentially fail, but to learn something from it that you know is is important from a really early age. Um, so children having that opportunity to make the same mistakes, eat the same amount of dirt as every other kid as well. Um, Izzy, sorry, just um, before we start to wrap up, um, just wondering if you um, had any reflections on the professional advocate um, question? Yeah, so um, I've only ever had a professional advocate once, and that was when I was going th through the process of potentially applying for NDIS. Um, and I, she was absolutely lovely. Um, she was very new to the disability sector and had a lot of optimism and hope, which I think was slightly misplaced, uh, uh, which obviously not her fault at all. Uh, she was very um, excited and really confident that we would be able to get NDIS funding, um, but it got to the point where you know, applying for NDIS was like putting my health at risk because, you know, there's so many things involved in applying for NDIS and so many appointments that you need to go to and all those sorts of things that I just determined that it wasn't the right time for me to be applying for NDIS because applying, the, the process of applying was putting my health like further, like making me worse essentially, which is a really interesting to think thing to think about, I guess. Um, yeah, but I also wanted to touch on yeah, dignity of risk. It's it's something um, that I think even professional advocates and professional support workers, you know, have trouble with. So let alone you know parents, but it is understanding that you can't necessarily, you can provide all the supports um, for someone, um, but you do need to let them learn and make make educated choices, you know, and it's, it's not about saying, no, you can't take this risk. It's about informing people of all the potential consequences of that behavior choice. Um, and then stepping away and saying, you now are you are informed as, as well as I can and as well as you can be. Now you get to make those choices. Can Thank I just you. add to that for a second? Yeah, please. <clears throat> we just had recently a, um, a post-school options expo at school recently. And it was interesting. We were talking to some one of the, an, another parent saying how 
it's so important to get our kids involved with support workers and going out and doing lots of different things and not just being stuck at home, but it widening their circle of support beyond just the family, you know, as young as possible. And um, and it was an interesting way. It was just a different way it was worded that made, made me just go think, oh, yeah, you know, I don't stop my 15-year-old son from going out and hanging out with his mates, yet I won't let her go and do things because I'm scared, you know, so that we have to change as parents the way we think about the supports and advocacy and all those sorts of things for our kids because eventually it is going to be somebody else that has to do that for her but they have to they've got to have a bigger circle than just us so um like you were saying is you know you need to be able to um you've got to teach them how to make the risks like how to take risks they're going to make mistakes the same as anybody but they have the right to do that we can't just molly coddle them and cotton wool them and go no 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 you can't you can't so i think as as Generally, as parents, we need to learn how to change that mindset as well, which is hard to do. <laughs> and thank you, Pat, for your vulnerability in um, in um, reflecting on that as well. Um, so conscious of, of time, um, and I know that um, Karen and Sarah, as our interpreters, um, are in hot demand in the disability sector. So we need to let them go and, and have some space. But... Um, in the slides that we shared, um, and you'll also get this in the follow-up as well, um, we included um, links to the next um, set of the webinars and also um, where supports and helpful information. And just wanting to recognise that um, please reach out to CIDA um, if anything that has concerned you about today's session. Um, I cannot um, overemphasize the power of hearing from young people um, in this space. Um, it has been a delight. I know we're only up to um, webinar number four and we've got two topics to go. Um, we're gonna to touch on um, the topic of school ready, which will be um, who, who actually needs to be ready for school. Um, could be a controversial one, stay tuned. Um, but the power of hearing from young people and their experience. And obviously, um, you know, I'd like to say thanks to Pat for um, speaking on George's behalf today and sharing that vulnerability as a, as a family member and the, the need for us to listen to young people. Um, so um, thank you very much for all joining us. Um, thank you, Izzy and Emily and Georgia and Pat for sharing um, so delightfully your experience. Um, and Karen and Sarah, the Our Online Interpreters, thank you. Um, so we'll end the session here and hopefully see you at our next one about school ready. Thank you, everybody.